All right, let's, let's move it on. The fun continues now with a look at how you can make work actually a little bit more fun. Specifically, the importance of play at work. Our next speaker is a self-confessed nerd. His words. He knew he wanted to be an engineer at the age of eight and currently has some 70 patents in the field of design, automation, methodology, circuits, and smarter systems as well. Ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for IBM fellow, Internet of Things, John Cohn. Wow. Hello, everybody. I gotta say, I am so honored and humbled to be sharing the stage with some of the stuff that people have done or what they're going to do. I mean, Tom Nay, I can't even believe. I'm gonna talk about something that comes, I'm at the other end of my career, 35 years to be precise. This is the only job I've ever actually had. And I'm gonna talk about some insights and personal transformation from my career, but not just that. I wanna introduce you to a couple of other people. That this is Gabe Mariano, my father-in-law, and sadly, he passed away a couple years ago, but he was 36 years in IBM, and he actually got hired out of high school. The company sent him to college. He would go out and be doing jumping jacks in the hall and uh, in the parking lots with all the other good IBMers. He made these incredible devices. He made these giant machines to help make the packages for our mainframes, but not, that wasn't the best thing he made. What he also made was my wife, my beautiful wife, also an IBMer, until after about eight years of it, she decided that two nerds was enough, and I am definitely a nerd. But I think I was just calculating back there, and I may ask Tanmay on this, but I think I have collectively 79 years of IBM experience, and a lot of things have changed. But it has been an incredible thing, and especially when you have when your company issues you a wife, you know you're working at the great place. Now, <laughs> Diane and I did a lot of making ourselves, and we made three beautiful boys with no help from the company, I'd like to say. <laughs> Max, Sam, and Gabe. And it was Gabe, our youngest, who kind of led to this story. And it was weird because I got invited to go talk at his high school. And I'll tell you something, nothing scarier. Now, you can imagine sitting out here. Luckily, I can't see all of you, but this is pretty scary. But you're going to talk at your kid's school. You know, if I suck here, I can walk away. But if you suck at your kid's school, you know, like. And, you know, I remember what it was like sitting on that hard bench and having some guy up there go, you know, old guy going, when I was your age. And I was like, God, I'm that old guy. What would I say? Well, the message was actually pretty interesting. And it was I, the, the importance that play has had in my career. Not just, I don't mean like just throwing a football around or going fishing. I understand that kind of work-life balance is very good. I've never really experienced it. But what I mean is that bringing play into your work and keeping that passion alive. So what I'm going to tell you is reflections on, I'll just say from my 35 years or from my collective 79 years, but the reason I mean that about play is at a very scientific level. I mean, you look at a kid, what are they doing? They're not worried about outcomes. They're not worried who's taking their ideas. They don't mind making any mistakes. As a matter of fact, there's been academic studies. There's a great book called, uh, by Jonathan Lehrer called Imagine. He cites some studies where they take kids and they ask them to do a creative task and they ask grown-ups, who do you think is more creative? Kids. That was an easy answer. Okay, ten minutes. Yeah. But just by going through and asking adults to pretend that they're kids makes them more creative. And so the idea of trying to bring that playful spirit back in, my first rule is keep your inner child. Or if you don't have an inner child, borrow one. So this is Gabe, and I tell you what, I get really nervous about stuff. And I was working on a technical paper, which is what I normally do, and I was just totally brain frozen. He grabbed me, took me down to the bridge in our little town, 45 feet, and he said, Dad, you're jumping. And I was like, I'm terrified of public speaking, I'm terrified of heights. But I'll tell you what, I took that picture, passed my phone back, and went over. And I'd like to say that I came up with a technical answer on the way down. All I was doing is, don't die. But it turned out 
it really it, it broke the logjam. So rule one, keep that inner child, okay? Try to figure out how to do that. Now, rule number two is find some playmates. Anybody know who that is? That is T.J. Watson Sr., the founder of IBM. I probably shouldn't make fun of him, but he was the guy, he was the guy that said all the world's problems could be solved if we could just teach men to think. Well, he also said, which I thought was pretty cool, he said, if you aren't playing well, the game isn't as much fun. When that happens, I just go out and play as I did when I was a kid. It's actually part of our lore. I don't know what you think about IBM, but it is an incredibly playful place. I mean, with four, what do we have, 430,000 people? There are some wonderful whack jobs, and a lot of them are here, and I really would like to say that. So the rule is, find some playmates. Always pretty, pretty easy to do when you're actually in a group that big. And when I actually look back, when I just kind of spotted through my career, I was 30 years as a chip guy. Any chip folks here? This is software. I tell you what, software, I don't get software, but chips, oh, they're concrete, they're wonderful. And I had the great good fortune of working for about eight years on the brains inside video games. You know, it was great seeing David and Phaedra talking about video games. I kind of worked on the guts of those, me and a hundred of my, or several hundred of my great colleagues. But I had the pleasure of working on these, these were like the first supercomputers that you could buy and bring home. And it was really, really hard work. And you know, there were times like, I don't, I don't know, I don't love my job every day. I don't know, do you? You know, I, it, was, it was hard, but when I would go home and talk to my kids or their friends or their friends' friends, and they'd say, what do you do? I said, well, I make video game processors. And they would go, whoa! And I'd go, and it would remind me that I loved it. So that's another one of the rules, is share what you love. I mean, for you, I, you know, I don't know what turns a software person on, but you know, maybe it's semicolons or whatever it is. <laughs> but if you share that, it can be really great. And even when this was hard, because these things were ending up under the Christmas tree, I remember going, well, can we get Christmas to come two weeks late this year? Nah, -uh. it was tough. And actually, some of the toughest times were actually working on processors where it was pretty esoteric. I was lucky to work on some of IBM's biggest processors, our mainframes and our scientific processors. Uh, my last one, well, I, was, I was, did the funny software that we used for, uh, for writing the chip, you know, for making the chips. This thing had, I think, three billion transistors, and it was hard. It, you know, interestingly, just a side point, it went on to be the brains of the first Watson. And I didn't know it then, but it's kind of ironic, because if you saw me speak on Monday, that's kind of my job now, so be careful what you play with, because it might end up going, going uh, be in your job later. But the rule here was about breaking the rules. This was so hard, we were competing with who could get the least sleep. I mean, we were just punchy. You know, we would be sitting there working, and our, our customers, who were other designers, would call. We would pretend, we would answer with fake accents just to keep it lively, you know. And, you know, it was really weird, because if you changed accents in the middle, they knew you were kind of, you know. But about breaking the rules, we couldn't get the designers to tell us exactly what they needed, so as a joke, we made a pretend tool to check their work. It was just really patched together. Well, I was both you know, proud and horrified to find nine years later they were still using that joke tool. So, break a few rules. The next thing is about turning over rocks. The cool thing is, I was working with some really smart people, but honestly, because I'm funny looking, and you can say I'm funny looking, I get invited to do a lot of this kind of stuff, and I got to go to Almaden, which is our, one of our beautiful research sites. And, and Almaden and Zurich were two of our research folks, or two teams that did an amazing thing. Back in 1998, do you know that before 1998, nobody had ever seen an atom before, or directly? I mean, they'd seen it indirectly. But these guys in Zurich and Almaden created something called the Atomic Force Microscope. You see that little thing with IBM? That was 18 xenon atoms, and that was the world's smallest advertisement. Well, luckily, my friend Don 
owned that $15 million machines, and he was using it for making like videos, like this thing, the boy and his atom. Those are individual atoms, you know, in sort of stop motion Gumby style. But you know what the great thing is, is that they used it for writing kind of naughty words and stuff, because, you know, who wouldn't, right? But, <laughs> and I'm going to change the tone a little bit. I happen to know that Don was very interested in beer. And so for two six packs of beer, I borrowed that machine. It, I'm, I'm apologizing up front because this part is not funny. I wrote my middle son, Sam's name, in 33 carbon monoxide molecules on a piece of, carb, on a piece of copper at three degrees Kelvin. And that made it the world's smallest memorial. And um, this is a, a tough story. Uh, I mean, I tell it a lot, but it's still hard. In 2006, our middle son, beautiful 14-year-old son, was on vacation in Florida, and he stepped off a curb, and a car swerved to avoid his friend and hit our son. And um, at that moment, his soul left his body, a strong kid, and we had to fly down there and make probably the hardest, easy decision we ever did, because we knew he, wanted to be a, uh, he would have wanted to be a, uh, an organ donor. And you could honor him, just if I may just take a moment, is if you can check that little box in your, your driver's license, or if you, you know, tell your loved ones what your preference would be around organ donation, that's all it takes. His strong organs went out to save four other people's lives. And we even got to meet some of those. Yeah. I think, now, you might, and I, I appreciate it. This is a kind of weird story to be telling in this because I'm talking about play, right? Well, it turned out, you can imagine, or you know what, I don't even want you to imagine, that's a tough, tough thing to reboot. And our, our whole family, I guess we're still in the process of rebooting. But do you know what? That what lesson of how we moved forward, play was an incredibly important part of it, believe it or not. Sam was just an amazing kid, so we started writing his name in rocks, sandblasting them and giving them to people. Well, that got to be hard, so we started making him with clay and put his name there, and that started to become so popular we would end up hearing from people. So I made, I learned PHP, and I'll tell you what, you know, it's, it's really the harder things are, the harder you have to play. I mean, anything that would force you to write PHP it was pretty bad, and it's okay to laugh. It's really okay to laugh because it's all about that. I made this website with over the last nine years, we just are hearing from these things. You know, people put them places, they find them places. They've been on North Pole, South Pole, high mountains. This one was actually launched into space in something called CubeSat and fetched out of the, um, out of the Atlantic by a ship. And if you go to samstones.org, we'll send you some too. But again, it was all about play. It was moving forward. And moving forward was really hard. What I ended up doing, though, is I found out, you know, we all heard about STEM processing and stuff like that. I found that starting to, especially the funnier I looked, I really needed to get my mojo back at home and at work. I started volunteering with my, my works uh, outreach program. And I'm sure wherever you work, there's something in there. You can go into schools and scare kids or whatever. Well, Speaking of scaring kids, we got an offer. This local charity that's called the Haunted Forest wanted to build a, an effect. So they asked me, and I asked uh, my alumni group. I went to MIT, the Vermont's own MIT club, Vomit. We got, <laughs> I named it. But we made a 21-foot tall robotic thing that made children run away and wet their pants. And if you think about a good use of an engineering degree, it is really, really amazing. And so my rule there is when you need to, to keep your play alive, give back. And it started to become like a thing of its own. I ended up, you know, working more and more with helping other people. I got into a bunch of social and political causes, and it turns out two of my good friends, Ben and Jerry, both good guys to know if you like ice cream, uh, are really into social justice. And a lot of they did was through making. And again, as I started to get my mojo back, I got invited to make a bunch of things. Like this is a 20 foot tall carousel for carrying half naked hippies across the desert. Well, you might say, what does that have to do with play? Well, because, 
It was amazing the kind of conversations that you could have for witnessing for science. I mean, I remember 3 a.m., 70-foot bonfire behind me explaining, you know, uh, turbo hydraulic drives and embedded processors, and, and this is where it comes back to work, embedded processors and LEDs. Now, this is an interesting thing because this is about, you know, work and play, right? Well, with work and play, this was a very interesting kind of thing because you see those LEDs there? Well, those LEDs, uh, you know, you walk around on the strip and you see that stuff there, but a couple of years ago, it wasn't so popular. I was in Shanghai a lot for my work, and they had these giant LED strips out on the, you know, on buildings to, be, to kind of, you know, show TV things. So I did the natural thing. As I bought some, the guy said, how many kilometers would you like? And I said, well, I'll just take a meter. And basically, I went into the elevator of the hotel and made a hat. But what was funny is I wasn't as smart as I thought I was. There wasn't very good documentation, and what was there was in Chinese. So I said, well, you know what? This is when I had started using social networking. Because you, you hipsters, you with your Twitter and stuff, I, I was kind of new at this. But I stuck out there and I said, look, I need help. And that is one of the laws of play. You know, if you don't know the answer, put it out there. So I put out that I hadn't been able to figure out, you know, how to make these cool fades. Well, it turns out I found somebody who was half my age, twice as smart, and, and this guy kind of added the extra code. Now, he threw my code back. We kind of tossed it back and forth. We put it out in open source. And a woman in New York picked it up. And that's the code that I and almost everybody use for this kind of stuff. So it's kind of about sharing. You know, that's another rule of play. And as it turns out, the reason that I'm here today has very direct reason, uh, direct link to that because I get called on to actually do these kind of like uh, public art. And we have this museum in the city of Burlington and it's got these gritty glass blocks. They gave me a commission and I got paid in grilled cheese, but oh, that's another story. But I got a commission to go take a bunch of high school students and college students and convert those gritty glass bricks into something that it had a little bit more playful spirit in it. You can see me on the bottom there. It has two connect things, and as you walk around, it can play uh, Pong, and it can do some other stuff. You can operate it remotely, and you can cause people to walk around. But the cool thing was that not only was I using these LEDs, IBM had just started promoting something called Blue Mix. Any Blue Mix fans out there? I mean, yeah, and I was like, you know, I'm a hardware guy, and I was like, Blue Mix? What is this thing? And it turned out I started using that, and I started using some of what are now part of our Watson IoT platform, MQTT, Message Hub. I started putting all of that together, and I said, wow, this stuff is kind of good. Well, fade to last year, IBM decides, you know, IoT is going to be a big thing. Well, what do I know about IoT? I can't even spell IoT. And so, but I went in there and I, they said, what do you know about IoT? And I said, I don't know, but I showed them this and they went, okay, you're hired. And I think as of about, well, I heard my boss say on the stage on Monday that I'm like the senior technical person in that area then. So be careful what you play with because it'll eventually come back, hopefully, to haunt you. And I want to leave you with one other message that one of the other big things about play is that you don't worry so much. And those of you who, and many of my dear friends are in the audience, they know I'm a big worrier. But this is about, you know how they get so tensed up about the outcome of something that you just can't have fun? This is about going out. Have you ever woken up and been on a, a post-apocalyptic reality TV show? <laughs> well, that happened to me. Uh, that's a long story, but I ended up on a, sh a show for Discovery, 59 days living with nine crazy people. So here I was, the only sane person. And <laughs> the, um, we were living on the floor, covered with dirt. It, you should go see it. It's on, you can watch it on Amazon. I don't think it's on Netflix anymore. But we ended up eating rats and eating dog food and cat food. And if, I'll tell you what, if it comes to the apocalypse, go for the cat food. But <laughs> we were dirty. We were dirty. And one time, it actually rained three times, but one time, early in the show, I ran out the back because it started raining. My, uh, my colleagues ran out to catch every lovely drop of water because we needed it. And I threw my clothes off. I won't do that now, but I, the, just the dirt and the stink were coming off. And I turned around and there was a $200,000 camera looking at me and I went, come on. 
He goes, dude, you ought to pick up that plastic. Okay, so I didn't even think about it. So fade forward, 56 more days, go back to work, you know, try to explain where I'd been because we weren't supposed to talk about it. Well, I got summoned to our monk, our headquarters, because the head of IBM marketing wanted to go, oh, isn't this nice? An IBMer, a senior IBMer is talking about science. And I tried to explain, well, it's a reality show. He seemed to like the concept, but I'm driving back and being the kind of worrier I am. I called one of the guys and he goes, ah, they loved it. You know, every third word was beep. And I was like, mm. he goes, don't worry about it. As long as you kept your clothes on. I went, Jeez. So the last 45 seconds, of this show, there I am after, thank goodness for pixelation. And I'm going, oh my God, you know, my parents are seeing this, my kids are seeing this, the, my boss, oh, the senior guy in IBM. And I was thinking, you know, like, whatever, you know, I can't get my software done or I'm not gonna get that contract. You think everything's gonna fall apart? My career's only gotten better. And when I saw that senior guy again, all he said was, dude, you should get more sun. So. <laughs> So that's basically it. I'll tell you this, as I was worrying about this talk, how meta is that, I ended up you know, opening a, a nice beverage, a recreational beverage in Vermont, and what did it say? It said, find the way through play. So whatever that is, passion in you, keep it alive, share, don't worry so much, and enjoy your day. Thanks. Oh my goodness.